by the river. Siddhartha wandered into the forest, already far from the town, and knew only one thing, that he could not go back, that the life he had lived for many years was past, tasted and drained to a degree of nausea. The songbird was dead. Its death, which he had dreamt about, was the bird in his own heart. He was deeply entangled in samsara. He had drawn nausea and death to himself from all sides, like a sponge that absorbs water until it is full. He was full of ennui, full of misery, full of death. There was nothing left in the world that could attract him, that could give him pleasure and solace. He wished passionately for oblivion, to be at rest, to be dead. If only a flash of lightning would strike him, if only a tiger would come and eat him, if there were only some wine, some poison, that would give him oblivion, that would make him forget, that would make him sleep and never awaken. Was there any kind of filth with which he had not besmirched himself, any sin and folly which he had not committed, any stain upon his soul for which he alone had not been responsible? Was it then still possible to live? Was it possible to take in breath again and again, to breathe out, to feel hunger, to eat again, to sleep again, to lie with women again. Was this cycle not exhausted and finished for him? Siddhartha reached the long river in the wood, the same river across which a ferryman had once taken him when he was still a young man and had come from Gotama's town. He stopped at this river and stood hesitatingly on the bank, Fatigue and hunger had weakened him. Why should he go any further? Where and for what purpose? There was no more purpose. There was nothing more than a deep, painful longing to shake off this whole confused dream, to spit out this stale wine, to make an end of this bitter, painful life. There was a tree on the river bank, a coconut tree. Siddhartha leaned against it placed his arm around the trunk and looked down into the green water which flowed beneath him. He looked down and was completely filled with a desire to let himself go and be submerged in the water. A chilly emptiness in the water reflected a terrible emptiness in his soul. Yes, he was at the end. There was nothing more for him but to efface himself, to destroy the unsuccessful structure of his life to throw it away, mocked at by the gods. That was the deed which he longed to commit, to destroy the form which he hated. Might the fishes devour him, this dog of a Siddhartha, this madman, this corrupted and rotting body, this sluggish and misused soul. Might the fishes and crocodiles devour him, might the demons tear him to little pieces. With a distorted countenance he stared into the water. He saw his face reflected and spat at it. He took his arm away from the tree trunk and turned a little so that he could fall headlong and finally go under. He bent, with closed eyes, towards death. Then, from a remote part of his soul, from the past of his tired life, he heard a sound. It was one word one syllable, which, without thinking, he spoke indistinctly, the ancient beginning and ending of all Brahman prayers, the holy Om, which had the meaning of the perfect one, or perfection. At that moment, when the sound of Om reached Siddhartha's ears, his slumbering soul suddenly awakened, and he recognized the folly of his action. Siddhartha was deeply horrified. So that was what he had come to. He was so lost, so confused, so devoid of all reason that he had sought death. This wish, this childish wish which had grown so strong within him, to find peace by destroying his body. All the torment of these recent times, all the disillusionment, all the despair, had not affected him so much as it did the moment the Om reached his consciousness 
and he recognized his wretchedness and his crime. Om, he pronounced inwardly, and he was conscious of Brahman, of the indestructibleness of life. He remembered all that he had forgotten, all that was divine. But it was only for a moment, a flash. Siddhartha sank down at the foot of the coconut tree, overcome by fatigue. Murmuring Om, he laid his head on the tree roots and sank into a deep sleep. His sleep was deep and dreamless. He had not slept like that for a long time. When he awakened after many hours, it seemed to him as if ten years had passed. He heard the soft rippling of the water. He did not know where he was or what had brought him there. He looked up and was surprised to see the trees and the sky above him. He remembered where he was and how he came to be there. He felt a desire to remain there for a long time. The past now seemed to him to be covered by a veil, extremely remote, very unimportant. He only knew that his previous life, at the first moment of his return to consciousness, his previous life seemed to him like a remote incarnation, like an earlier birth of his present self, was finished. That it was so full of nausea and wretchedness that he had wanted to destroy it, but that he had come to himself by a river, under a coconut tree, and the holy word Om was on his lips. Then he had fallen asleep, and on awakening he looked at the world like a new man. Softly he said the word Om to himself, over which he had fallen asleep, and it seemed to him as if his whole sleep had been a long, deep pronouncing of Om, thinking of Om, an immersion and penetration into Om, into the nameless, into the divine. What a wonderful sleep it had been. Never had a sleep so refreshed him, so renewed him, so rejuvenated him. Perhaps he had really died. Perhaps he had been drowned and was reborn in another form. No, he recognized himself. He recognized his hands and feet, the place where he lay and the self in his breast. Siddhartha, self-willed, individualistic. But this Siddhartha was somewhat changed, renewed. He had slept wonderfully. He was remarkably awake, happy and curious. Siddhartha raised himself and saw a monk in a yellow gown with shaved head sitting opposite him in the attitude of a thinker. He looked at the man, who had neither hair on his head nor a beard, and he did not look at him long when he recognized in this monk Govinda, the friend of his youth, Govinda who had taken refuge in the illustrious Buddha. Govinda had also aged, but he still showed the old characteristics in his face, eagerness, loyalty, curiosity, anxiety. But when Govinda, feeling his glance, raised his eyes and looked at him, Siddhartha saw that Govinda did not recognize him, Govinda was pleased to find him awake. Apparently he had sat there a long time waiting for him to awaken, although he did not know him. I was sleeping, said Siddhartha. How did you come here? You were sleeping, answered Govinda. And it is not good to sleep in such places where there are often snakes and animals in the forest prowling about. I am one of the followers of the illustrious Gotama, the Buddha of Sakyamuni, and I am on a pilgrimage with a number of our order. I saw you lying asleep in a dangerous place, so I tried to awaken you, and then as I saw you were sleeping very deeply, I remained behind my brothers and sat by you. Then it seems that I, who wanted to watch over you, fell asleep myself. Weariness overcame me, and I kept my watch badly. But now you are awake, so I must go and overtake my brothers." I thank you, Samana, for regarding my sleep. The followers of the illustrious one are very kind, but now you may go on your way. I am going. May you keep well. I thank you, Samana. Govinda bowed and said, Goodbye. Goodbye, Govinda, said Siddhartha. The monk stood still. Excuse me, sir, how do you know my name? 
Thereupon Siddhartha laughed. I know you, Govinda, from your father's house and from the Brahmin school and from the sacrifices and from our sojourn with the Samanas and from that hour in the grove of Jetavana when you swore allegiance to the illustrious one. You are Siddhartha, cried Govinda aloud. Now I recognize you and do not understand why I did not recognize you immediately. Greetings, Siddhartha. It gives me great pleasure to see you again. I am also pleased to see you again. You have watched over me during my sleep. I thank you once again, although I needed no guard. Where are you going, my friend? I am not going anywhere. We monks are always on the way, except during the rainy season. We always move from place to place, live according to the rule, preach the gospel, collect alms, and then move on. It's always the same. But where are you going, Siddhartha? Siddhartha said, It is the same with me as it is with you, my friend. I am not going anywhere. I am only on the way. I am making a pilgrimage. Govinda said, You say you are making a pilgrimage, and I believe you. But forgive me, Siddhartha. You do not look like a pilgrim. You are wearing the clothes of a rich man. You are wearing the shoes of a man of fashion. And your perfumed hair is not the hair of a pilgrim. It is not the hair of a samana. You have observed well, my friend. You see everything with your sharp eyes. But I did not tell you that I am a samana. I said I was making a pilgrimage, and that is true. You are making a pilgrimage, said Govinda. But few make a pilgrimage in such clothes, in such shoes, and with such hair. I, who have been wandering for many years, have never seen such a pilgrim. I believe you, Govinda. But today you have met such a pilgrim in such shoes and dress. Remember, my dear Govinda, the world of appearances is transitory. The style of our clothes and hair is extremely transitory. Our hair and our bodies are themselves transitory. You have observed correctly. I am wearing the clothes of a rich man. I am wearing them because I have been a rich man. And I am wearing my hair like men of the world and fashion because I have been one of them. And what are you now, Siddhartha? I do not know. I know as little as you. I am on the way. I was a rich man, but I am no longer. And what I will be tomorrow, I do not know. Have you lost your riches? I have lost them, or they have lost me. I am not sure. The wheel of appearances revolves quickly, Govinda. Where is Siddhartha the Brahmin? Where is Siddhartha the Samana? Where is Siddhartha the rich man? The transitory soon changes, Govinda. You know that. For a long time, Govinda looked doubtfully at the friend of his youth. Then he bowed to him, as one does to a man of rank, and went on his way. Smiling, Siddhartha watched him go. He still loved him, this faithful, anxious friend. And at that moment, in that splendid hour, after his wonderful sleep, permeated with Om, how could he help but love someone and something? That was just the magic that had happened to him during his sleep, and the om in him. He loved everything. He was full of joyous love towards everything that he saw, and it seemed to him that was just why he was previously so ill, because he could love nothing and nobody. With a smile, Siddhartha watched the departing monk. His sleep had strengthened him, but he suffered great hunger, for he had not eaten for two days, and the time was long past when he could ward off hunger. Troubled, yet also with laughter, he recalled that time. He remembered that at that time he had boasted of three things to Kamala, three noble and invincible arts, fasting, waiting, and thinking. These were his possessions, his power and strength, his firm staff, he had learned these three arts and nothing else during the diligent, assiduous years of his youth. Now he had lost them. He possessed none of them any more, neither fasting, nor waiting, nor thinking. He had exchanged them for the most wretched things, for the transitory, 
for the pleasures of the senses, for high living and riches. He had gone along a strange path, and now it seemed that he had indeed become an ordinary person. Siddhartha reflected on his state. He found it difficult to think. He really had no desire to, but he forced himself. Now, he thought, that all these transitory things have slipped away from me again, I stand once more beneath the sun, as I once stood as a small child. Nothing is mine. I know nothing. I possess nothing. I have learned nothing. How strange it is. Now when I am no longer young, when my hair is fast growing gray, when strength begins to diminish, now I am beginning again like a child. He had to smile again. Yes, his destiny was strange. He was going backwards, and now he again stood empty and naked and ignorant in the world. But he did not grieve about it. No, he even felt a great desire to laugh, to laugh at himself, to laugh at this strange, foolish world. Things are going backwards with you, he said to himself, and laughed. And as he said it, his glance lighted on the river, and he saw the river also flowing continually backwards, singing merrily. That pleased him immensely. He smiled cheerfully at the river. Was this not the river in which he had once wished to drown himself, hundreds of years ago? Or had he dreamt it? How strange his life had been, he thought. He had wandered along strange paths. As a boy, I was occupied with the gods and sacrifices, as a youth with asceticism, with thinking and meditation. I was in search of Brahman and revered the Eternal in Atman. As a young man, I was attracted to expiation. I lived in the woods, suffered heat and cold. I learned to fast. I learned to conquer my body. I then discovered with wonder the teachings of the great Buddha. I felt knowledge and the unity of the world circulate in me like my own blood. But I also felt compelled to leave the Buddha and the great knowledge. I went and learned the pleasures of love from Kamala and business from Kamaswami. I hoarded money. I squandered money. I acquired a taste for rich food. I learned to stimulate my senses. I had to spend so many years like that in order to lose my intelligence, to lose the power to think, to forget about the unity of things. Is it not true that slowly and through many deviations I changed from a man into a child, from a thinker into an ordinary person? And yet this path has been good, and the bird in my breast has not died. But what a path it has been! I have had to experience so much stupidity, so many vices, so much error, so much nausea, disillusionment, and sorrow, just in order to become a child again and begin anew. But it was right that it should be so. My eyes and heart acclaim it. I had to experience despair. I had to sink to the greatest mental deaths to thoughts of suicide in order to experience grace, to hear Om again, to sleep deeply and to awaken refreshed again. I had to become a fool in order to find Atman in myself. I had to sin in order to live again. The path is stupid. It goes in spirals, perhaps in circles, but whichever way it goes, I will follow it. He was aware of a great happiness mounting within him. Where does it come from? he asked himself. What is the reason for this feeling of happiness? Does it arise from my good long sleep which has done me so much good? Or from the word Om which I pronounced? Or because I have run away? Because my flight is accomplished? Because I am at last free again and stand like a child beneath the sky? Ah, how good this flight has been, this liberation. In the place from which I escaped, there was always an atmosphere of pomade, spice, excess, and inertia. How I hated that world of riches, carousing and playing. 
How I hated myself for remaining so long in that horrible world. How I hated myself, thwarted, poisoned, and tortured myself, made myself old and ugly. Never again, as I once fondly imagined, will I consider that Siddhartha is clever. But one thing I have done well, which pleases me, which I must praise, I have now put an end to that self-destruction, to that foolish empty life. I commend you, Siddhartha, that after so many years of folly you have again had a good idea, that you have accomplished something, that you have heard the bird in your breast sing and followed it. So he praised himself, was pleased with himself, and listened curiously to his stomach which rumbled from hunger. He felt he had thoroughly tasted and ejected a portion of sorrow, a portion of misery during these past times, that he had consumed them up to a point of despair and death. But all was well. He could have remained much longer with Kamaswami, made and squandered money, fed his body and neglected his soul. He could have dwelt for a long time yet in that soft, well-upholstered hell if this had not happened, this moment of complete hopelessness and despair and the tense moment when he had bent over the flowing water ready to commit suicide. This despair, this extreme nausea which he had experienced, had not overpowered him. The bird, the clear spring and voice within him was still alive. That was why he rejoiced. That was why he laughed. That was why his face was radiant under his gray hair. It is a good thing to experience everything oneself, he thought. As a child, I learned that pleasures of the world and riches were not good. I have known it for a long time, but I have only just experienced it. Now I know it not only with my intellect, but with my eyes, with my heart, with my stomach. It is a good thing that I know this. He thought long of the change in him, listened to the bird singing happily. If this bird within him had died, would he have perished? No, something else in him had died, something that he had long desired should perish. Was it not what he had once wished to destroy during his ardent years of asceticism? Was it not his self, his small, fearful, and proud self, with which he had wrestled for so many years, but which had always conquered him again, which appeared each time again and again, which robbed him of happiness and filled him with fear? Was it not this which had finally died today in the wood by this delightful river? Was it not because of its death that he was now like a child, so full of trust and happiness, without fear? Siddhartha now also realized why he had struggled in vain with this self when he was a Brahmin and an ascetic. Too much knowledge had hindered him, too many holy verses, too many sacrificial rites, too much mortification of the flesh, too much doing and striving. He had been full of arrogance. He had always been the cleverest, the most eager, always a step ahead of the others, always the learned and intellectual one, always the priest or the sage. His self had crawled into this priesthood, into this arrogance, into this intellectuality. It sat there tightly and grew while he thought he was destroying it by fasting and penitence. Now he understood it and realized that the inward voice had been right, that no teacher could have brought him salvation. That was why he had to go into the world, to lose himself in power, women, and money. That was why he had to be a merchant, a dice player, a drinker, and a man of property, until the priest and samana in him were dead. That was why he had to undergo those horrible years, suffer nausea, learn the lesson of the madness of an empty, futile life till the end, till he reached bitter despair so that Siddhartha the pleasure monger and Siddhartha the man of property could die. He had died, and a new Siddhartha had awakened from his sleep. He also would grow old and die. Siddhartha was transitory. All forms were transitory. But today he was young. He was a child. 
the new Siddhartha, and he was very happy. These thoughts passed through his mind. Smiling, he listened to his stomach, listened thankfully to a humming bee. Happily, he looked into the flowing river. Never had a river attracted him as much as this one. Never had he found the voice and appearance of flowing water so beautiful. It seemed to him as if the river had something special to tell him, something which he did not know, something which still awaited him. Siddhartha had wanted to drown himself in this river. The old, tired, despairing Siddhartha was today drowned in it. The new Siddhartha felt a deep love for this flowing water and decided that he would not leave it again so quickly.